This video illustrates the proven antecedent strategy. That's a name that I've given to a process that we often have to use when we're stuck at the top of a proof and we find that we have a contradiction symbol at the bottom. Let's get started. We can see that on line one we have an ampersand as a main connective. It's boring, but we know what to do. Break it up. W, T, one ampersand out, done twice. And now we'll check it off. All right, line two, arrow is the main connective. If I had S arrow T on another line, then I could do arrow out, but I clearly don't. This line two is actually going to be the star of this proof. You can tell that at some point we would like to do arrow out. And so really what this process is going to be about is setting up the ability to do arrow out on line two. However, we're not prepared quite yet to work on that. So at the moment, we just say, well, can't work on line two. Lines three and four, those are uninteresting. Time to go to the bottom. Well, I have a single capital letter at the bottom, and that means that I should make a box for tilde out. I happen to have made a box, and here it is. I'll just stick it in place. Yes, this box doesn't have the homey appeal of a hand-drawn box, but it is nice and square. Line 5, we're going to write tilde m. And this will be a provisional assumption for tilde out. And of course, we make four-sided boxes so that at the bottom, we can put our new conclusion or our new goal, which of course is a contradiction symbol. And so now our box is set up, and we're back up at the top looking for things to do. All right, once again, we run through these things. If we had S arrow T, and we don't, so we can't work on line two. W and T, still uninteresting. Tilde M, a line with a single tilde in front of it is just as uninteresting as a single letter by itself. So yes, we're still stuck at the top with nothing to do. All right, it's time to go back to the bottom. Now we go to the bottom, though, and we have a contradiction symbol. Well. That's the situation when we know we're going to have to be a little creative. And the first thing you should think about is this strategy that I call proven antecedent. Let's look at the steps. First step, look for a formula of the form P arrow Q arrow R or tilde P arrow Q arrow R. Well, notice that's exactly what we have on line two. The arrow is the main connective. Check, arrow's main connective. And then you also have an arrow in the antecedent. Yes, we have an arrow in the antecedent, so this does work. Let me point out that I know that some people look at line two, and I happen to have a handy version of it right here. There it is. Sometimes people look at that line, and they don't see that it's an instance of P arrow Q arrow R. In fact, many people would tell me, look, this is just P arrow Q. Well, yes, it is an instance of P or OQ, but formulas can be parsed in multiple ways. So notice, I could say to myself, I'm going to think of S as P, I'm going to think of T as Q, and then I'm going to think of the entire consequent here as R. So this is an instance of P or OQ or R. Notice, every formula is an instance of P. So yes, formulas can play different roles. OK, so I did find an instance of one of these two formulas. Check. Step two, pencil in the antecedent. Well, the antecedent is just the fancy word for everything that's in front of the arrow. But remember, this makes so much sense if you just say to yourself, I really want to do arrow out on line two. What would I need to have on another line to do arrow out? Obviously, I'd need to have S arrow T. Notice, I'm going to pencil it in in the middle of the proof. Check, I've just done that. I put it in the middle because that gives me space above to prove it, and then it gives me space below to continue the proof. OK, well now, step three, I have to prove what I penciled in. I happen to have made another box here, and there it goes. Oh darn, I made it a little too big, but I think 
I can move this thing. There we go. Come on down and scooch over. All right, that'll work. The arrow of what I of my antecedent, excuse me, the connective in my antecedent is an arrow, so I can prove it using arrow in. I put S at the top of this box. I put T at the bottom. That's line six. P A for arrow in. And the truth is, these is this is one of these boxes that is complete as soon as you built it. Why? Because we already had T on line four. And so over here, all I have to do is write for repetition. And now I just finished the proof. Uh, now, excuse me, now I just, I have proved SROT. I have successfully proved the antecedent, six through seven, arrow in. So check, I proved the antecedent. In fact, you might well say the proven antecedent strategy has now been completed. But I put in this fourth step as a reminder. Why the heck did we do this? It was so that we could go back and do the arrow out on line two. Once you've proved the antecedent, apply arrow out to the original formula to get the R part. That was the whole point of doing this. And so on nine, we'll write W arrow M, and that will be two eight arrow out. And now we continue to work looking for a contradiction. Of course, let me point out that it, now this box up here is off limits to us. You can never use a line inside a box to justify anything below. But of course, tilde M is available to us, as well as all these lines above it. Always a good idea to go back and check things off every once in a while. So I checked off one, uh, I can check off four, six and seven, two and eight. This just helps focus my attention. In fact, I say, well, W arrow M is the only thing I haven't worked on that's interesting. And I do have a W, so on 10 I will get M. Well, that's not right. 10 M goes there. And over here, what it was uh, the, the justification, uh, which is 3, 9, arrow out. 3, comma, 9, arrow out. And now I have a contradiction of M and tilde M, and I'll put those together. M ampersand tilde M. So that would be for 510 ampersand N. And now on 12, the entire box, 5 through 11, tilde out. And the proof is complete. So, quick review. Stuck at the top with a contradiction symbol at the bottom, you go look for a line of the form P arrow Q arrow R. You pencil in the antecedent part to set up the arrow out. You prove it, and then you go back and you do the arrow out, and then you continue the proof. All right, um, I hope you've enjoyed this strategy. Having just completed the proof, I'd now like to point out that there's an alternative way to approach it that actually saves a couple lines and a box. So I'm going to do this again. Line one, break it up and write W and T, same as before. And now, I check that off and look at line two. If I had S arrow T in another line by itself, then I could do arrow out on two. Well. Before, I recognized that I didn't have S arrow T, so I said, well, it's time to go to the bottom, make a box. But if I think about what is necessary to build S arrow T, I say, I have to prove S arrow T. And it turns out that you can prove a conditional if you can prove that the consequent is true. And so when I notice that I have T on line four, I think to myself, I could jump in and attempt the proven antecedent strategy right now, even without first assuming the opposite of M. And so what I'm going to do is just pencil in S arrow T into the middle of my space right now. 
And then I'm going to go get my box, which I have below, and put it up above this. Now, all I have to do is put S at the top of this box, T at the bottom. This is a provisional assumption for arrow in. And then I can do the repetition on 4 and get 4R. And I have proved the antecedent already. Well, I know why I did that. It's so I could do the arrow out and get W arrow M by 2, 7 arrow out. And now I'm done with the proof already. This becomes 9 by 3, 8 arrow out. 3, comma, 8 arrow out. The point of doing it in this alternative way is to acknowledge that proven antecedent doesn't have to be done when you're stuck at the top with the contradiction symbol at the bottom. I invite you to, th what I'm trying to do is build a method that will get every proof done with sort of the minimal amount of creativity. That it will just, a to, I want to build a method that will mechanically do every proof. And so, in general, you should use this strategy when you're stuck at the top with a contradiction symbol at the bottom. But if a case arises and you notice that you could do it more efficiently, like this, this is legal. I should point out, when you start looking for these things and you start getting creative, oftentimes you can make proofs harder for yourself. But I did want to point out that there is this alternative way to proceed.